Good day, everyone, again. Uh, welcome to the eighth SPL meeting, uh, where we will discuss current uh, trends and current impacts, economic and social, uh, of the COVID outbreak from a regional perspective. So a few words about the Spatial Productivity Lab, which is our more research-oriented unit within the CFE, which is OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions, and Cities. Our we conduct research uh, with the goal of identifying policy solutions that increase productivity uh, with no places left behind. So our research seeks to find uh, um, productivity drivers that can help places to perform better. My name is Alexandra Tsvetkova. I am an economist and policy analyst uh, at the OECD Trenta Center for Local Development. And I do manage uh, activities of the SPL with consultation with other lab members. Today, I will be moderating uh, this meeting. So I'm joined today by a wonderful uh, panel of speakers. Um, I would like to ask to move to the next slide so everybody can see the speakers here. I will be introduced them one by one uh, as we go. And I, will, I would like to start by inviting Joaquim Oliveira Martins, Philip McCann, and Alessandra Proto to offer their opening remarks. Uh, before I invite them to speak, actually, I will give uh, brief introductions. And I would ask my speakers to uh, intervene in the order as they uh, appear on the agenda. So as introduction, Joaquim uh, Oliveira Martins is the deputy director of the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions, and Cities and Spatial Productivity Lab is within the center. And probably most importantly for us, Joachim is actually the thought leader who is behind the establishment of the Spatial Productivity Lab. Uh, Professor Philippe McCann um, is uh, the chair in urban and regional economics at the University of Sheffield. And he is also a co-director of the Productivity Insights Network which is a collaboration among researchers, uh, policymakers, intermediaries, and business who work together to identify the ways of raising productivity in the United Kingdom. And Productivity Insights Network is the partner of the SPL. Last but not least, Alessandra Proto, <coughs> excuse me, is the acting head of the OECD Trenta Center for Local Development, and she supervises the activities of the center including the Spatial Productivity Lab and the Capacity Building Initiative. So I would like my speakers to uh, begin, and the floor is yours, Alessandra. So thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Good morning uh, for those who joins us from uh, the Americas, and also good evening uh, for the others. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for sharing uh, your time with, uh, with us. Um, as my colleague Alexandra Tsvetkova said, we are uh, used to have, this is already the eighth meeting of the Spatial Productivity Lab, which is used to collect their partners in meetings throughout the years uh, to do conversations about um, issues related to spatial productivity from different angles. Um, this time uh, it's an e-meeting, so it's a, e a webinar, and this gives us also the possibility, of course, to reach much more people. And uh, I'm really very proud and, and happy to see that we are, there are really a huge number of participants that will uh, for sure uh, bring their uh, questions and their ideas and will uh, enrich, uh, enrich our discussion. Um, so... Uh, I, I just would like to add a few more words to uh, the excellent presentation that Alexandra did already uh, about the Spatial Productivity Lab and the Trento Center. So the Spatial Productivity Lab, uh, as uh, she said, is a dedicated research laboratory um, that works on analysis and it's part of the, um, is integral part of the OECD. But the interesting side here is that it's really conceived as a lab um, with a number of partners, partners uh, uh, from the region where uh, the Trento Center is established. Trento is a, is a town in the northern part of Italy. So that means uh, um, that partners from, the, from our territory are the University of Trento, um, the University of uh, Bolzano, 
the uh, several the autonomous uh, provinces of these two of this region as well as uh, the uh, statistical offices um, the bank of italy because there is also a, um, an, an office analytical office of the bank of italy uh, but also other universities uh, from the rest of from other parts of italy such as the university of brescia um, but also around the world, uh, like the uh, like the um, uh, PIN uh, network, which is uh, an initiative uh, joined by the University of uh, Sheffield, where we have a, a representative today, Professor Phil Khan, uh, as well as the uh, Ohio State University with the Swank program. Um, and the Swedish Entrepreneurship Forum. So this is just to give you an idea about our partners that are um, a number, as well as, sorry, I forgot one more, that is the EURAC Research Center uh, in the autonomous province of Bolzano. Um, this is just to give you an idea that we leverage on a, a bulk of knowledge that is, that is existing on our territory, but also across uh, uh, the OECD uh, member countries. And our idea is really to keep uh, the work of the laboratory as a place where ideas come up, where we try to um, think uh, about new, uh, new issues and how really to um, identify, uh, how to, to understand better what are the special, link, the special links that can improve productivity growth uh, and uh, therefore helping by uh, creating better jobs and, uh, and well-being. So um, I uh, invite you, of course, to um, stay tuned with the activities that we are doing. Uh, Alexandra Tsvetkova is uh, uh, the leader of this uh, laboratory and she's organizing a lot uh, of activities as well as uh, also writing uh, of papers. So uh, on our website, you'll find everything. I just now uh, leave the world to um, our uh, next uh, speaker. In this case, I invite uh, Joaquim Oliveira Martins, uh, our deputy director, uh, to intervene. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra. Are you listening okay? It's working, the sound? Perfect. So uh, thank you so much for having uh, organizing uh, this, um, this uh, webinar. I think this is a very important uh, discussion and uh, really it's good that uh, the Special Productivity Lab of Trento is in the, for the front line. And of course, the two um, Alexandras, Alessandra Proto and Alexandra Svetskova, uh, having sort of a, in the in the driving of um, a, a this event. So, my my introductory remarks are really that uh, I I've, I've been of course following very closely at the OECD what's um, these developments, and there are really two views um, in some sense that emerged. The first view was that basically this is a big shock. This is a big shock to the economy. And uh, governments want to support, in some sense, the, the economy to resist uh, to this shock. So this is a kind of a, a sort of Keynes uh, view of the world. Uh, uh, so the important role for the government to sustain the economy, in some sense, to bounce back to the previous uh, equilibrium. So you need to sustain income for people, workers, etc. You know, to allow enterprises to remain alive, either by grants uh, or, or sort of loans. Um, but as sort of the time goes, I have the impression that people talk more and more about the more structural view of things. Of course, we are still pretty much in this crisis management mode. In the, a lot of governments are doing this support, but these structural issues are emerging more and more. And of course, they are pretty much connected with the, with the, with the work of the Special Productivity Lab. So, in this perhaps more Aiken view of the world, so crises always bring structural consequences. Uh, things like relocation of capital, so uh, things like uh, exit and uh, entry mechanisms, a certain um, preoccupation on orienting this support, can even be liquidity support, but orienting this support in some sense to, to help some of this structural sort of a transformation, uh, even sort of uh, orienting certain sort of a technological sort of a trends. The idea that this crisis could be uh, an acceleration of, cert uh, of certain trends, for example, everybody talks about digitalization, also the connections with the energy uh, transition. So, but either you are in a, in a sort of mindset or the other, and basically you need to be in, in both types of mindset because you need to, to think both about the short term and long term. I think we need to, uh, you know, this, we, we need to think about the impact on regions and cities because, of course, a uh, very important question, uh, all cities will rebound. 
after this shock. We know that cities, rural regions, have very different profiles in terms of uh, the dynamics of uh, how they resume uh, productivity and growth after, uh, after a crisis. What are going to be the structural changes? For example, you know that productivity in cities is mainly a, an issue of connections, uh, proximity, interactions. How you reconcile that with the need for a social distancing, for example? Not easy, huh? For example, we need to deconfine and at the same time maintain a certain social distance in cities. How cities are going to engineer, in some sense, this, uh, this new morphology, perhaps, in cities. Rural areas, probably, they are going to be uh, sort of a hit uh, uh, for a lot of regions uh, in terms of, uh, for example, access to certain public services, uh, possibilities for digitalization. But there is also some, uh, some I would say, uh, opportunities, you know, uh, some, some things can be now perhaps, uh, 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 you know, be done in a remote, uh, distant working mode that perhaps were not contemplated before, right? But then what kind of conditions need to be put in place in order for these opportunities to materialize, how to address the digital divide? And all this, the question of productivity is completely key because uh, we are talking a, a massive economic shock. So uh, the OECD said 2% on average for the OECD minus 2% of GDP per month of confinement. So we are ready in uh, two months and uh, this confinement uh, probably is going to be very gradual. So I'm not going to make here any kind of uh, projections, but uh, you know, things like minus 10% of GDP or more in many OECD countries are extremely likely. So this minus 10% or more of GDP translates immediately in the kind of the same order of magnitude for the public support, public deficit. And this translates into debt, right? Um, it can be financed in other ways, but basically it could be translated into, into that. So, uh, you know, we know that in many countries, the central banks are monetizing this, uh, this sort of public debt. Uh, they are buying the public debt in secondary markets, but it's clearly, clearly, I think, that if the productivity, if the gross prospects will not sort of uh, change, if really we are in a kind of a secular stagnation type of uh, sort of a perspective, it's going to be very difficult to justify the increase of these debts over the long run. So the productivity discussion, I think, is at the core of the management uh, uh, of this crisis, both in the short term and in the, in the long run. So I'm extremely happy that we have this discussion, and I'm even, even more happy that I'm, now I'm going to give the floor to Professor Philip McCain, which I, I think doesn't need to be pre, sort of presented. Everybody knows very well uh, Philip McCain. So to kind of give also his uh, uh, sort of first, uh, first statements. Philip, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody, wherever you are. Um, I was thinking about the title, the, the division that uh, all the colleagues here work as part of, um, the themes, entrepreneurship, SMEs, uh, cities, regions, other areas of their speciality would be local labor markets, tourism, it seems to me that everything which is in the domain of this particular directorate division within the OECD is absolutely central to the shock and even more central to the recovery. It's hard for me to think of a set of issues which are more centrally, squarely located. I mean, these issues really are in the eye of the storm. And to think about the future, we need to think about what are the lessons from the past and previous shocks um, from, from recent experience over the last 10 or 15 years, but also longer term adjustments. What do we know or do we think we know about the current shock, the nature of the shock? What are the kind of implications, trajectories, pathways that seem to be emerging? And then to try and think through how they may play out in the near term, in the medium term, and in the long term. Um, there are going to be enormous challenges for different parts of the world, different uh, countries, but I'm particularly focused, obviously, as people here are on the on the regional, on the city, on the local dimensions. And I think that it's important to keep these these issues squarely on the agenda because they are going to be central to not only the nature of the shocks, but particularly the the post shock uh, recovery transitions. I'll stop there for the moment.
Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Alessandra, Joachim, and Philippe. That was a very great uh, opening. Thank you, Alessandra, for really detailed introduction, but also to Joachim and Philippe for literally previewing everything that we will be on the table today. So before we move to the first presentation, I would like to give a brief overview of the structure so we know where we are. Uh, the meeting today is organized around three blocks. Uh, two first blocks will be presentations by experts, first on the economic impact of the COVID crisis and the second one on policy implications. Within each block, we will have two speakers. Each speaker will have up to 10 minutes and I will ask everybody to try and keep the intervention as short as possible because we are likely to run out of time. And this also applies to myself. I will try to be short. Uh, after this, we'll go into the highlight of our meeting where Philippe and Joachim will be invited to join again and answer three questions, but also questions from the audience. Also, after each block, we will have, especially after the, the first and the second one, we will have short Q&I session. So please, if you have any questions, you can pose them in the Q&A um, little button. It opens a window where you can type your questions and we will be happy to pick them up. So now I will move to the first presentation of this session, which will discuss the short-term economic effects of the COVID-19 outbreak. And my colleague, uh, Paolo Vineri, uh, will be the first speaker. Paolo is an economist and he is the head of the Regional Analysis and Statistics Unit at the Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. And he did quite a bit of research work on a lot of uh, different aspects of rural and uh, of urban and regional economics, including migration, spatial um, structures, entrepreneurship, inequality, well-being, and uh, many others. I'm very happy to have Paolo here and Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexandra, uh, and good morning or good afternoon to everybody, depending on where you are. Um, what I would like to provide to you in this uh, few minutes is um, some insights on uh, what is the, the potential uh, impact of the COVID-19 crisis uh, across space uh, for OECD countries. So this is the key question that uh, I'm trying to address. Rather than, uh, let's say, um, making an analysis on, uh, on the actual impact that we have had so far, it's really about, um, in South, about the potential impact that and how this will, will basically distribute differently across different types of uh, cities or different types of regions, especially. So um, the idea is that um, if you want, if we ask ourselves um, how much a region um, is affected, can be affected by, by the COVID-19 crisis, especially we are talking about the lockdown measures um, since we have uh, um, we are focusing on the economic aspects. Then we have to consider many, many sources of, uh, of this impact. Now, um, today, um, the, the first thing I would like to show you is about uh, really the, uh, the regional labor markets. Okay, so what is the impact in terms of the jobs that can be considered threatened by, by the COVID-19 crisis? So uh, what we did uh, first so in tri is trying to uh, basically um, having a map of OECD regions, where for each region we have a share of the total regional employment that can be considered uh, at risk from the COVID crisis. At risk doesn't mean that we are talking about job losses. We are just talking about the upper bound of the, the total amount of jobs that can be threatened. Um, if you can go to the, to the next slide. Um, so the idea came up from the uh, report, uh, a note that was published by the OECD economic departments um, that evaluated the economic impact overall at national level uh, on GDP, let's say the initial impact, not on an annual basis, but really on uh, during the, the lockdown, and uh, looking at the sectoral composition of, of countries. So they identified uh, key sectors that are considered as they are assumed to be more more affected by the lockdowns and are the sectors that you, you see in this slide. Um, so manufacturing, construction, and, and particularly uh, I look at uh, sectors like the uh, arts, entertainment, but uh, food accommodation, so all the tourism uh, sectors and the, the wholesale and retail trade, uh, air transport and so on. So these are sectors uh, whose activity during the lockdown is assumed to decrease by, uh, let's say, uh, from 50% to 70%. 5% or even, uh, or even more. 
So, um, and if you can go to the, to the next slide, based on this approach, uh, um, our colleagues from the economic departments basically uh, assessed that, I mean, the initial impact could, uh, could be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in, the, in the order of 20, 25% of GDP, not, again, not on an annual basis. Uh, an annual basis, the, the figures are more in order of the 10%, 9%, uh, depending on the countries, most affected, of course. But then the idea was that uh, we wanted to know how this can uh, distribute in terms of jobs in the, in the regional labor market. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, what we did is we uh, looked at uh, the, um, the sectoral composition of each region uh, using, uh, let's say, the most detailed data that we have uh, for OECD countries on the, on the sectoral composition of uh, the regional employment. And uh, we classified, uh, we, we identified those sectors that, that uh, I showed at the beginning are considered most affected. And then we estimated out of that uh, the share of total regional jobs that can be considered uh, threatened. If you can go to the, to the next slide, please. Uh, so this map actually shows the results of, of, of the estimation. It shows basically almost uh, all OECD countries. There are some, uh, some missing for lack of data, but uh, there are a large number of OECD countries and some uh, non-OECD in Europe. And uh, what we see here is that there are, uh, there are differences, of course, there are, dis there are disparities. If you look at the share of jobs potentially at risk, uh, the larger disparity, for example, can be observed in countries like Greece or Slovak Republic in Europe or Romania or France in Europe also, but also you know, outside Europe, look at the United States um, and Canada. So uh, there are uh, emerging patterns that are uh, quite clear. Um, if you look at Greece, for example, I mean, uh, you can compare, you can see that there are, there are almost more than 30 percentage points in terms of the share of regional jobs uh, considered uh, potentially at risk. From the central Greece, which has slightly more than 20%, to uh, the touristic islands, uh, like, uh, for example, the South Aegean Islands, which are the most uh, hit, according to our uh, estimations where more than half of the employment, if, of course, under the hypothesis that the lockdown will be, uh, let's say, as strong as in any other countries, as long as in other, uh, other countries, and then will be relatively more, uh, more hit. But there are also other, uh, other patterns. Uh, for example, if you go to the next slide, uh, we show um, for each country that we cover, uh, we show the, the most hit region potentially most hit region. And basically what we found here is that um, there is a clear pattern of large cities, let's say, or even capital regions uh, and the tourist destination are those that emerge more, um, usually on average, they have higher uh, share of jobs at risk. Why? Because of course, because of the hypothesis we made that they are more specialized in the sectors that are considered most affected. Uh, the tourist destination, of course, tourism is a, is a sector which is uh, uh, unfortunately very, uh, very hit from, the, from this crisis, but there are also specific regions like the capitals, which are more um, specialized in professional service activities or wholesale, uh, wholesale retail, or wholesale trade or food accommodation. Uh, these are all, um, let's say, aspects that are particularly, uh, that are prevalent in, uh, in um, in capital regions or large, uh, large cities, large metropolitan regions, let's say. So these emerge as uh, most affected uh, and most at risk. There are also other considerations like regions that are most, uh, mostly, let's say, uh, exposed to, uh, to global markets. I mean, so they are more specialized on wholesale trade or retail. These are also uh, particularly. Then uh, this is a view that um, really, in a sense, look at the factors of risk, the factors that in this particular situation can put specific places at more risk in terms of the labor market. But I would like to complement this also with a perspective instead of resilience. So there are other factors that uh, could mitigate this, uh, these risks and that actually could provide instead more resilience. Um, we, we mentioned at the beginning uh, the, the issue of, uh, of telework. And uh, in fact, this is something that uh, I would like to show if you go to the next slide. Uh, basically, we are the, the COVID-19 crisis has forced us to run, I think, the largest experiment of teleworking and online schooling and many other activities through digital uh, platforms, which we have ever seen. 
Um, so the degree of, of uh, the extent to which uh, our occupations can be performed remotely, as we are doing, uh, actually some of us already uh, experimenting now, is crucial to maintain activities ongoing and, and is an element also for the residents of, of the places, which can compensate the risk I just uh, discussed. We try to measure the degree of uh, what we call teleworkability, so the, the extent to which uh, occupations can be, can be amenable to telework. Here we don't look at the sectors of economic activities, instead we look at which type of occupations people do in places, so which type of tasks they, they perform. Uh, consider, for example, comparing the same sector like, uh, I don't know, education in university, and you can um, compare, with, uh, let's, let's say, uh, an academic professor with another uh, type of jobs that require the physical presence uh, in the, um, like janitors working in universities. So these are two different occupations that one can be performed uh, remotely and another, another not. Um, so uh, we estimated for all European countries the differences. Uh, we classified basically all types of occupation that are uh, recorded in the labor force service according to, um, to a sort of degree of teleworkability building on a work uh, that was published, an academic work uh, exactly on this topic, where that was, a, that was a, let's say, a classification of types of occupation and the uh, extent to which they can be um, amenable to teleworking. And we basically have a clear pattern observed, first of all, a uh, broad picture uh, that if you compare cities and rural areas, in cities there is a prevalence of occupation that, that, are, that can be uh, performed remotely uh, more easily. Then, uh, but if you go to the next slide, and there are on average nine percentage points between cities and, and rural areas. Uh, if you look at, uh, yes, this slide uh, basically uh, shows the, um, for each country that we can cover, the regions with the highest uh, teleworkability and with the lowest. And again, uh, a clear pattern emerges. The capital uh, regions or the largest metropolitan regions at the beginning, I said, okay, these are uh, from a sectoral perspective, they are most affected in the short term, but they can be more resilient. As you can see, in most countries, the capital uh, is really maybe also for the, for the functions the, that are, are um, prevalent in the capital regions. These are those that emerge with the, with the highest uh, degree of, uh, of, of teleworking. Uh, then, um, if you go to the next slide, I mean, uh, of course, the occupations reflects also uh, the, the skills of the regional labor force. Uh, if we correlate the, the degree of, uh, let's say, the, the share of uh, regional labor force that can telework with the uh, level of education, here in this graph you see the, on the horizontal axis basically the share of uh, labor force with the tertiary education. On the vertical axis you see uh, the share of, people, of workers that can potentially telework. There is a very, very clear uh, correlation, uh, also suggesting that actually the skills of the labor force can provide a source of resilience also to the channels of uh, remote um, of, of remote working. And, uh, and finally, uh, just uh, um, my final point is that with this new unprecedented experience of uh, working through digital platform that we are experiencing, uh, in order to, to be resilient, uh, we also need the right infrastructure. Um, so, uh, and this reveals, um, these are, uh, if you can go to the next uh, slide, uh, basically this, um, the extent of the digital infrastructure, for example, the access to, to the high-speed internet, the fiber, uh, within countries is not, uh, is not evenly distributed. We see this slide actually is updated to, to, to last year, so now probably some regions or some countries are catched up. Uh, but um, we, we can see that, that here, I mean, there, there can be very, very large difference in the extent to which then, from the point of view of, of digital infrastructure, a place can be more or less ready to, to a dramatic change like the one that we are experiencing. Look at, for example, uh, Portugal, the region of Lisbon is practically entirely covered by fiber and other regions are less. Uh, and so, and this similar pattern can be, can, can emerge, let's say, um, can be seen also in other countries. Um, Although here there is not a clear, uh, let's say, uh, city uh, and a rural area pattern. Uh, with this, I think I, I conclude. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Very, very insightful and uh, actually combining. It looks like we are really in an unprecedented situation and actually we... Oh, 
trying to understand how we will emerge from this crisis might be a little bit more uh, challenging, uh, partially because of the trends that Paolo was describing that are counteracting each other in the sense that larger cities are more susceptible to the decline in jobs, but they also have more opportunities. So it actually really depends now maybe on policies and how the uh, path out of this crisis is uh, structured and how we all work together to emerge stronger. Definitely will emerge more digitalized, that's for sure. Uh, but again, when we talk about uh, the ways out, I think uh, analysis like Paolo did is really, really important. But one of the challenges that we researchers, uh, policymakers, et cetera, we're all uh, facing is that we lack data which is current. So it's really because the changes are such unprecedented, we do not really know whether the patterns that we kind of build on our prior experiences will be working this time the same way. And our, Apparently, there are a few data sources that allow us to track, uh, to track uh, changes in real time. Of course, it's a separate question how they are representative and how much they can be used, but for some purposes, they can be used. And in my presentation, uh, I would like to show what we can learn about changes in labor demand uh, from the web scraped uh, vacancies. So, uh, if I can get my first slide, please. So I would like uh, today, I would like to show uh, changes in the uh, labor demand uh, for four countries, English speaking countries for which uh, burning glass data is available. So that's uh, the data source. Uh, we need to keep in mind what it actually, uh, what I will be showing because the numbers I will be showing are quite dramatic. So Paolo was talking about local labor markets as an employment. Uh, what I will be showing will capture actually labor demand and changes in labor demand. So it is one piece of the uh, local labor markets where quite dramatic decreases are observed right now. Uh, for those of you uh, who do not know what burning glass data is, it is a, a web scraped uh, data, uh, data set, uh, which uh, offers pretty much real-time coverage of the changes in the online postings of the vacancies. It has a lot of important and very useful information for analysis, but uh, of course it has certain disadvantages which we need to keep in mind when we are uh, interpret our results and try to read uh, out of what we find. Probably most important is that this data source and the analysis that I will show is the most reliable for the higher, um, higher segment of the labor market where employers are more likely to post their jobs or vacancies openings online. So if we would like to move to the next slide, please, Roberta. So here are the countries for which we have data. It is United States, Canada, United Kingdom, and Australia. Here it is uh, combined with New Zealand. This slide, show, uh, this slide shows uh, four um, kind of weekly vacancies that are recorded in the data in this year. The first data point is January 4th, and the last one is May 4th, which is just three days uh, ago. My presentation in, the, uh, in, the, in terms of time, to keep it short, I will have pretty much only three main messages, which will boil down to one takeaway. So my first message in this slide is that we do observe uh, a collapse pretty much in labor demand in the last month. If you look, it's not really visible here because of the scaling, but the, under each country, you can see the percentage decline from 4th of January, the first data point here, and the second line is the decline from the highest level in this year. So we do see really substantial changes and decrease in the labor demand as recorded in the burning glass data, which ranges from minus 5% in the United Kingdom to minus 85% in Canada if we compare it to the number of vacancies that were posted on February 29th. Uh, Roberta, could you please move to the next slide? Okay, now the second point is that there are great spatial variation in how regions are affected by the crisis or how much uh, the labor demand 
changed or decreased over time in the last few months. So in this slide, I'm showing percentage decreased from January to April of this year. And the first slide on the, the first graph on the slide is the one of the interest. Two things uh, come out from this. First of all, we have large variations in how bad the regions within countries are affected not only within countries, but also across countries. So we have United States and Australia being affected not as much in the best performing regions, but the spread across regions is really big. We have United Kingdom and Canada who are affected way more, but then the difference across regions is smaller. Roberto, next slide, please. Um, now, I would like to show you the distribution, the regional distribution of the uh, vacancy reduction um, in three countries on this slide and in the fourth one on the next one. So we have United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia. And here, we would like to see that, first of all, there are really variation how much regions differ within countries, but also we see that capital and larger or more diversified regions are not necessarily the least affected. And this comes back to what Paolo was showing, because from the sectoral perspective, they are more likely to be affected. On the other hand, they have more capabilities to uh, fight the current situation and to emerge less affected in the, in the current situation. So to give a few examples, we have Ontario, which is the capital uh, region in Canada, being less affected. On the other extreme, we have uh, London, which is the third worst affected region in the United Kingdom. Next slide, please. Here we have the same for the United States and for the uh, purposes of picture, actually United States seems to be the most useful example because of the large variation, many regions, but also because it is a big economy. So we have like quite a big spread across regions with uh, New Hampshire being affected with the reduction of about 4% and then going all the way to Nevada, which is really tourist dependent destination with the decrease of our 46%. Thank you, uh, Roberto. Next slide, please. Now I would like to uh, come to the second uh, point uh, of my presentation and probably the most important one. When we conduct our analysis, we always make assumptions on how industries, occupations are likely to be affected. And we kind of assume that there is one number for an industry. In this slide, I would like to show you that there is a great regional variation in how regions were affected in specific, uh, specific industries. So there is variation within industries uh, that re different regions react differently. So here, again, because USA is a large economy and it is easier to show it here, but we do see the same pattern in other countries. I show distribution by region, um, again, the reduction in vacancy announcements for arts, entertainment, and recreation, which is the most affected industry in the United States, and public administration, which is the least affected industry in the United States. Um, in the third slide, or the second slide, if there were numbers on the charts I had, you would see that public administration in the States decreased by 20% and arts, entertainment, and recreation decreased by 70%. If you look at the regional distribution, we see that for public administration, some of the regions actually grew quite impressively in terms of online vacancy announcements, and some regions decreased also quite impressively. More or less the same we see for arts, entertainment, and recreation. So probably my main point is that regional, uh, regional nature and the region and places, they do matter. And uh, maybe we need to add an extra layer to our analysis to better understand uh, what is going on and how we will be affected by the ongoing crisis. Next slide, please. So this one will be short. I think I just want to show that again, we see differences across regions within the same industries. Uh, th this shows Canada and Australia. Um, and uh, the magnitude of differences still appears quite large, even though we have only a few regions. Next slide, please. These slides are for United Kingdom. Again, two 
Industries one most affected, one least affected. For the most affected, it is accommodation and food services, and the less, least affected human health and social work. Um, two charts to show different uh, geographical detail. Uh, for those coming from the United Kingdom, I have to uh, make a little disclaimer. The lower chart shows uh, local enterprise partnerships, which are actually overlapping, so they cannot be really used for um, for this analysis here, but I would like to show it just for the purpose of illustration. So as we go into smaller regions, we do see larger differences and greater variation in how different regions within the same industry were affected. We did the same analysis for occupations and we actually have the same uh, heterogeneity. So places do emerge as uh, important, uh, not really drivers, but place and nature of place is important in this type of analysis. And right now we try to estimate our ongoing work of the Spatial Productivity Lab. We are trying to estimate the actual impact using the burning glass data, um, impacts of industries, but also of places to try to see how they compare and uh, what is the magnitude, how much this fixed effects of the place are important. So I would like to ask you to stay tuned uh, for the future SPL outputs. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Roberta, I'm done. Thank you. All right. So let's see. Uh, we seem to have questions here. Uh, and I would like to, okay, check one more source for the questions. We have probably just two minutes. Um, okay, how to approach countries that have low skilled workforces since the effort to change this takes some generations. What to do with these people? Which jobs and social dignity? I think that would be more uh, for Paolo. Would you like to take this one? But this is a real policy question, so I'm not sure it was um, necessary for me, but for the entire panelists, I think, uh, very challenging. I mean, um, one, I mean, I think there are a number of measures that can be taken. Um, we would like to do, I mean, from an analytical perspective, uh, what we would like to do is exactly the next steps to go more granular in terms of groups of people. I mean, I, I, I um, in, in the previous presentation that I did today, actually, of this, of this work, many, uh, many questions emerged from, uh, from some cities about uh, the different effect for different groups of people meaning uh, migrants, meaning those that have a temporary jobs or let's say that have non-standard contracts. Um, so I think these are all, or also adding uh, regions with low skilled um, is, a, is another type of, uh, let's say, uh, subgroup of, uh, let's say, of people to, that we need to, to address. But I think there is not one, on, one response only, so uh, maybe some of our colleagues can, can also complement on this. Okay, let's uh, maybe take one more question. Uh, Paolo, that's again for you. I'm really throwing everything your way. Uh, capitals and cities with high entrepreneurship rates are known to better overcome crisis and be more resilient. I wonder if you are planning to map ready index, uh, which would be interesting. Ready means uh, regional entrepreneurship development index, I assume. Yes, um, and this also links to what I just said. Um, we would like to look also at the entrepreneurship, but um, uh, there is a main, mainly there is a data question here. So we mm, we had to uh, say so we are facing the challenge of trying to measure uh, an impact where data at uh, the local level, let's say the official data, the data that we can use normally to compare to make international comparisons are not available yet. They come with a lag. Uh, with respect to the national data, the, 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 the subnational data comes with a much long, uh, kind of much more important lag. Therefore, uh, in the short term, what we can do to, to, to also look at this issue of entrepreneurship, for example, which would be very interesting, is trying to use uh, alternative sources of information like the one that Alexandra just mentioned, like on, uh, on burning glass or let's say uh, using other let's say less conventional, maybe less comparable and less robust from some point of view, but uh, more that could really provide a complementary information on what we know today of uh, the actual uh, impact uh, 
from different types of groups uh, in terms of what's the role of entrepreneurship and so on. So, so there is this willingness, but uh, but according with different, let's say, with, uh, specific methods that we'll have to, to find out. All right, thank you so much. I have, I think we have to move because we are already running behind the schedule by about 10 minutes, but uh, it was partially my fault as well. So now we would like to move on the second block of our presentation, of our meeting, which is devoted to the policy responses. And I would like to invite our first speaker of this block, uh, Mattia Carbetta, who will offer us an overview of the regional policy responses to the COVID outbreak here in Italy a country that was hit hardest, at least until very recently, and country that was hit actually first in Europe. So the country introduced quite a bit of policies uh, and restrictions. So we'll start with Mattia, uh, who is a policy analyst at the OECD Trenta Center for Local Development. And before joining us, uh, he worked as a policy advisor at the Italian Ministry of Economic Development, where he did quite a bit of really exciting work and he contributed to the design of the Italian Startup Act, which many of you know from a lot of uh, academic publications in the literature, and also National Plan on Industry 4.0 and other policies on digital and inclusive entrepreneurship. Mattia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alexandra. So, uh, hi everybody. Um, I'm very glad to present on Italian regions as a new policy responses in the context of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So the Trento Center, since the very early days of the COVID emergency has been making an effort to map Italian regions as a new policy responses in the context of the COVID-19 emergency. This is part of a broader effort by the OECD that has started from the very early days of the crisis and aimed at contributing to tackling um, the so-called corona crisis through a vast array of actions, including uh, measurement of key impacts, gathering of data, and mapping and analysis of policy responses. The latter in particular span across a vast array of um, policy areas, such as labor, healthcare, education, and importantly, business and SMEs. In particular, the Center for um, entrepreneurship uh, of the OECD has been making a huge effort to track national SME policy responses with the objective of fostering the exchange of practices, uh, fostering peer learning between policymakers and providing guidance on the short term measures and analysis on longer term consequences and the impacts of uh, the current crisis. So the OECD Trento Center's work is part of such a specific effort. It's a pilot spin-off focusing on Italian regions. Next slide, please. So um, what makes Italian regional SME policy responses particularly, particularly worth of observation for comparative purposes? Well, as Alexandra already mentioned, first of all, Italy has been hit earlier and harder than any other European country then uh, it should be highlighted that this country is home to a huge number of SMEs, which account for a disproportionately higher share of the national value added employment than most EU and OECD countries. And uh, in addition, similar to other countries, regional initiatives are an integral part of national SME policies. But most importantly, Italy, um, is home to large pre-existing regional imbalances that now are at risk of exacerbation, like in some other countries. For example, when it comes to the regional differences of unemployment rates among OECD countries, Italy presents the second largest spread between its top and worst performing region. And another uh, factor is that the four most affected regions in terms of casualties account for uh, 48.2% of Italy's GDP out of Italy's 21 regions. Um, as I was saying before, these balances are now at risk of being uh, exacerbated, and I would like to mention on this account that according to recent estimates, the likelihood of companies located in southern Italy to exit the market are four times higher than those in the north and the center. That is, the most vulnerable uh, macro area of the country is more at risk than the most advanced ones. So the main questions underlying this work are what types of policies have been put in place, 
what are their linkages to EU and national policy framework, and how do such imbalances reflect on the policy approaches adopted in this first phase of uh, the COVID crisis. Next slide, please. In terms of the methodology, this is a real-time mapping that makes an exclusive use of institutional sources and in particular legal sources, such as decrees of government from regions or provinces and regional laws account for 55% out of the 278 policies mapped. Of course, to each of these methodological choices corresponds a challenge. Uh, an intrinsic challenge in a real time, map, time mapping is, of course, uh, the logical gap between the approval decisions and their publication. Uh, fragmentation and proliferation of legal sources was another major obstacle, and uh, not to overlook also the uneven quality of detail available across policies. So, as a consequence of the of such challenges, this work does not claim to be complete in spite of the huge number of policies collected and uh, also some degree of approximation should be accepted as this was needed to obtain intelligible results. Next slide, next slide please. So let's um, take a look to the evidence collected. We decided to group our 278 policies into six uh, broad policy macro areas that are here um, uh, ranked in uh, descending order in terms of uh, their uh, occurrence. The first um, important macro area includes measures aimed at simplifying administrative procedures for SMEs, such as the deferral of deadlines for fulfillments or applications for public incentives. A second uh, type, um, which is also quite frequent, concerns direct public funding from regional authorities to SMEs in the form of non-repayable loans or low interest loans. A third type concerns measured measures aimed at fostering access to bank credit through moratoriums and bank loans, interest rate subsidies of regional credit guarantees. A fourth area concerns labor and welfare policies, such as the regional management of the regional share attributed at the national level of the redundancy fund incentives for smart working and regional work benefits. Then we have tax relief, such as the deferral of regional taxes, planning and budgeting. Um, so all in all, it should be observed uh, that um, the two most frequent types of policies belonging to each macro area cover more of 50, more than 50% 50 of the measures attributable to, to each macro area. Next slide, please. So when we look, take a look at the regional propensities across uh, policy macro areas, well, we will see the following. There are lots of uh, extremes, for example, in terms of coverage of regions for each policy macro area, we will have on the one hand, um, two macro areas, the one in the central part of the slide, the orange and the green one, that is access to bank credit and labor and welfare that were covered by all of Italy's 21 regions, and, um, and, and one macro area planning and budgeting that was covered just by, um, by, by, one, by 15 uh, regions. Then in terms of um, the regional um, coverage of areas, we have eight regions covering all of the six areas and one covering uh, just three. So we've seen there are lots of extremes in this polls somehow suggest the high, the high degree of heterogeneity in the policies approach, policy approaches fo followed by Italian regions. Next slide, please. Another way to uh, look at the question of the diversity of policies within macro areas and across regions is choosing a specific macro area in this example, but of course this could be repeated throughout the six macro areas that was uh, previously mentioned. Uh, which is public funding, uh, it can observe that three regions are colored in white, meaning that they didn't adopt any measure uh, falling under this macro category. But then we have, have that tiny uh, region colored in um, dark uh, red uh, at the center of Italy, Abruzzo, that has experimented with the widest range of policy types for than any other Italian region. Uh, just to make this specific example, Abruzzo's policies in the field of public funding include microcredit, subsidized loans, 
direct grants to companies to, um, to fund specific types of investments and advanced payments. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the time distribution of policies, um, this slide confirms that simplification policies have been the predominant macro area since the beginning of the observation period and the reluctance to adopt tax relief policies, the yellow line in the slide, has been a constant since the very early days. At the same time, uh, another key highlight of the slide is that public funding policies, that is the red um, curve, um, were marginal until the end of March, but then suddenly started to increase and became the second largest group by mid-April. So the question there is what happened? The next slide will provide us with some hypotheses. Well, um, it should be highlighted that 50.1% of the overall regional financial effort during phase one draws from European structural investment funds. So out of uh, 1.37 billion euros spent by regions during the observation period, uh, about a half comes from European funding. Then the following factors should be taken into account. Um, first of all, the largest share of European structural funds go to southern regions because of their historical, traditional delay in terms of economic development. Secondly, um, southern regions uh, present a marked delay in expenditure. And thirdly, uh, between mid-March and the beginning of April, um, the European Commission uh, issued three communications aimed at relaxing rules on state, on state aid. On top of that, there was a proposal by the central Italian government between mid-March and the beginning of the and the end of the month to reprogram and spend sums from southern regions and gear them direct them towards northern regions that were most uh, severely um, hit by the crisis and are the so-called uh, economic engine of the countries. So the interaction of these um, European policy framework, national policies and moral suasion actions and regional uh, initiatives resulted in um, spectacular a surge upwards in terms of the overall regional financial effort between the end of March and the beginning of April. And if we look at the territorial break breakdown of the financial effort, we will see that southern Italy uh, clearly stands out, accounting for 47.5% of the overall regional financial effort. Next and last slide, please. So, um, as it looks now, this work is an instant note limited to phase one, that is, it comprises exclusively the so-called rapid policy responses. Our ambition in the medium term is to turn it into a fully fledged report extending to the recovery to the so-called phase two. Of course, for this um, ambition to be pursued, we need to pass from a one-shot product focusing on a specific key country to a comparison with an iteration in other countries and regions. In particular, partnering with regions from uh, other European OECD or non-OECD OECD countries would allow us to um, increase the availability of data on, on policies, on legal sources, and importantly, on the outcome of such policies in order for us to be able to observe and analyze the, poli the policy impact. Ultimately, uh, we would like this one-time pilot on regional SME policies in the face of the COVID emergency one day to become, um, how to call it, a place-based toolkit to draw policy implications to help SMEs weather not only this specific emergency, but any other emergency that may arise in the future. Last slide, please. Very happy to uh, answer any question during the Q&A section. Uh, should you need any in-depth information, feel free to drop an email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mattia. That was uh, quite uh, comprehensive and insightful. And actually, I think it's really useful in the sense that the world literally is looking at Italy to see how uh, policymakers are responding to the current situation and how, like, what are the results of these uh, interventions. Um, this applies to economic uh, consequences, but also to uh, health outcomes and how the spread of the disease is uh, 
prevented or how we are able to flatten the curve. And here, uh, again, Italy was at the forefront, uh, introducing very restrictive uh, limitations on quite a few liberties. And uh, honestly, I was really uh, impressed by Italians how disciplined they were in the beginning of the quarantine. Unfortunately, after almost two months, it seems that there is a fatigue and people are not as likely to follow the orders, which might increase the likelihood of the spread and new, uh, new outbreaks. So I think here, it, um, the um, behavioral economics, I think, can help because, uh, again, as I said, in liberal, uh, liberal democracy, policymakers have quite limited number of uh, policy tools or anything else that would uh, allow them reduce the liberties. So how would it be possible to manage expectations in a way that uh, ensure the maximum compliance? And uh, one of our partners, uh, a professor at the University of uh, Bozen Bolzana, Mir Katanin, who will be speaking next, did research exactly on this topic. So I would like to introduce Mirka, who is our, our good friend and SPL partner as well. He's leading his work and how uh, his university communicates with the OECD Trento Center. Um, so Mirka is a professor of economic policy at the Faculty of Economics and Management of the pre-university of Bolzano, uh, Bozen Bolzano, I apologize. He is also a vice dean for research and director of the Master in Public Policy and Administration program at the same university. So Mirka, I'm very happy that you agreed to speak uh, today in our meeting and I invite you to start your presentation. The floor is yours. So thank you very much, uh, Alexandra, for the nice introduction. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, what we wanted to understand was uh, how to design uh, the lockdown uh, policies uh, to ensure maximum compliance. Uh, so what we did uh, is uh, a survey of a representative sample of the Italian population, uh, more or less uh, 900 people, uh, and uh, we surveyed them uh, three times. Uh, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a panel, so it's uh, uh, three uh, cross-sectional uh, surveys. Uh, as you know, uh, the lockdown was established in Italy at the beginning of March, between the 8th and the 9th of March. And uh, at the beginning, it was supposed to last until the 3rd of April. So between the 18th and the 20th of March, uh, we had uh, the first uh, uh, survey. And uh, uh, we asked people a series of questions that I will detail uh, later on. Uh, later on, on the 1st of April, uh, the lockdown was extended until uh, the 13th of April. And uh, we had a survey between the 8th of the and the 9th of April asking uh, the very same uh, questions. And then uh, there was a further extension on the 10th of April until uh, Monday, uh, the 4th of May. And again, we surveyed people in between the 22 and the 22nd, and the 23rd of, of April. On uh, the 26th of April, uh, uh, there was uh, an extension that uh, uh, relaxed uh, some uh, measures. So now uh, the lockdown in Italy is, uh, is a little bit softer compared to what, uh, to what it was. So with these three surveys, uh, we capture also the three phases of the epidemiological development. So at the beginning, uh, we are capturing a phase in which uh, the pandemic is growing fast, in which the message in the media is that uh, the situation is getting worse and worse. We don't see an end to this. The second survey is taking place in a moment uh, in which uh, we have reached the peak, so to speak. And the message in the media is that uh, yeah, things are starting to slow down. Uh, we reach the peak. And the last survey is in a moment in which uh, there is a descending phase. Uh, so uh, things are slowly getting, uh, getting better. So what we ask is uh, what people are doing in terms of compliance. So are you uh, visiting friends? You're not supposed to do it. Are you visiting relatives? Uh, are you going to the supermarket uh, uh, as seldom as possible? And so on and so forth. Then uh, we ask them whether they know uh, about uh, the duration of the measures. So, of course, this is uh, shifting in the three waves. And what their expectations are about uh, a possible extension of these measures. So we ask them uh, uh, 
do you think that indeed on uh, uh, the 3rd of April, the measures will be lifted or do you think that there will be an extension by a few weeks, a few months or uh, until necessary? And then we ask them also, we present them uh, three different scenarios. Suppose that the lockdown is indeed extended by a few weeks. How do you see your behavior changing? And uh, we ask them basically whether they will uh, keep their behavior as it is or uh, actually increase their effort or decrease their effort. And finally, we ask them uh, how long they think they can uh, um, keep going uh, in the lockdown and how long they think other people uh, can keep going. So if you uh, show the next slide. So first of all, as uh, Alexander pointed out, what we had was a, a, a picture of a country that uh, was uh, responding and complying. Uh, so we had uh, uh, for all measures, uh, quite a high compliance. Uh, we, we presented six different behaviors and 50% of the sample uh, uh, kept uh, all six. Uh, so six measures that uh, they were supposed to keep in social isolation. The other 50% uh, didn't keep all of them, but most uh, people kept most of the measures. In terms of expectations, there is a big shift uh, in the free surveys. So if we look uh, at, uh, uh, at the first uh, part, so do people think that uh, the lockdown will indeed end at the, uh, at the declared date? That was the 3rd of April, the 13th of April, and the 4th of May. We see that at the beginning, nobody uh, believes uh, that it will end. Uh, but uh, in the last survey, uh, suddenly 40% of the people say yes, on the 4th of May, uh, the measures will be lifted. And this happened only partially, in the sense that there was some relaxation, but uh, definitely not uh, a lifting of all the measures. And in general, what we see is that uh, while at the beginning, the first survey, there is a quite a, a split between uh, a mass of people that uh, believe that uh, there will be an extension of a few weeks only, and the mass of people that believes that actually the extension will be much longer by a few months or even uh, until necessary, as, as far as needed. Uh, we see that uh, already in the second wave, there is a shortening of expectation. Uh, and then in the third wave, there is a very strong uh, shortening. So people start at the beginning, they have a very, uh, let's say, a negative uh, uh, expectation in the sense that they believe that, uh, uh, that uh, lockdown will last for long. But uh, as things improve, as the message in the media change, then they revise uh, their expectation. And this matters. If you uh, show the next slide, uh, what, uh, what we did uh, was uh, to, to construct a measure of uh, matching and mismatching between uh, expectations and uh, scenarios. So uh, if uh, uh, you expect uh, that uh, the lockdown will be extended by a few months, let's say, and I tell you, okay, uh, what will you do if uh, it will be extended by a few months? This is a matching. Uh, the, the scenario uh, matches uh, your expectation. However, if I tell you, uh, suppose that it will last, uh, it will be extended by a few weeks only, then uh, this is a, a positive surprise in the sense that uh, it's actually shorter than you thought. And if I tell you that, uh, look, it will actually be extended indefinitely until uh, deemed necessary, this is a negative surprise because it's longer than you expect. And what we see is that uh, this uh, matching and mismatching uh, uh, actually matters in terms of intended compliance. In particular, what we see is that uh, whenever people receive a negative surprise, so they are facing a scenario that is actually worse than uh, uh, their expectations, then they are intended, uh, uh, they, their intention to reduce compliance uh, is actually increasing. So they are less likely uh, to keep uh, their self isolation measures to improve them, and they are more likely to actually de de declare that they will decline uh, their effort. And uh, so this is uh, evident in all three. Uh, in the fourth, no, sorry, in all three, in the, in the third, in the last one, in the last survey, what we see is that there is a general shift upward. Uh, so there is a general uh, increase in the intention to reduce uh, uh, compliance, but uh, uh, facing a, a longer extension generates a very big, uh, um, uh, intention to, to reduce compliance 30% uh, 
uh, of the people declare that uh, they want to, to reduce their effort. So this uh, underlines uh, the importance of designing, first of all, uh, the lockdown in a proper way. So potentially uh, we could have had uh, a lockdown uh, uh, that was uh, declaring at the beginning to be indefinite, uh, or to, as we did, uh, to have uh, a date. Of course, uh, you know, the date uh, can be short or long, and in some sense, uh, having a relatively short date buy, buys you some additional compliance in the short term. In the sense that uh, people say, okay, I can, I can keep uh, doing this uh, for three or four weeks. However, uh, if, as happened, you need to extend uh, this uh, deadline further because uh, the epidemiological situation has not improved uh, quickly enough, then uh, you may pay the cost of this uh, initial increase in compliance because uh, by setting uh, a short-term date, uh, you may have changed the expectation of people towards uh, a shorter duration. So there is a fine balance there. And also it's very important to communicate clearly that uh, um, the duration can be pretty long. This is uh, relevant now, but of course, uh, if uh, it happens that uh, similar measures need to be imposed again uh, in, uh, in the near future, then it would be uh, important to, to keep in mind. Uh, last thing, what we found uh, is that 40% uh, uh, of people think that uh, they can keep going for long periods. Uh, for months or until needed. However, only 15% of people believe that the others uh, can keep going for long periods. So uh, considering that uh, all these efforts are, have a public good nature, so basically uh, it doesn't really matter whether I, as a single person, uh, keep uh, social isolation to stop uh, the spreading of the, of the disease, everybody has to do it. Uh, so believing that uh, other people are not doing it can be actually quite, uh, quite dangerous because even if uh, I want to do it, if I believe uh, that uh, nobody else is doing it, then my efforts are quite useless. And uh, from this point of view, I think uh, that uh, a big role in, in, this, um, in this expectation may have been played by media that uh, tried to uh, emphasize, I think, uh, uh, a bit too much uh, uh, episodes of non-compliance, uh, and this may have spread uh, the opinion, but it was actually wrong, uh, that uh, you know, non-compliance was, was quite common. This may have discouraged uh, people in their own effort. Um, okay, so I think uh, I'm uh, within my time, and uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to, to reply. All right, thank you so much, Luca. Oh, it was quite insightful, and really, I do see this, what you are finding pretty much real life. Uh, so we do have a lot of questions in our Q&A uh, tab, but I would suggest that we would move to the next uh, session and then we have uh, a longer time slot planned for questions and answers and I hope we will still have time to answer some of them. I also would like to encourage our experts to check for, un uh, for questions that are addressed to them and maybe uh, reply in written in the Q&A uh, window. So um, let me move to the first question of the, um, of the round table discussion. The first one is, what will be the most important economic consequences of the pandemic and what is the role of geography? I would like to, um, I would like to ask uh, Joachim and Philippe to join me. Uh, Joachim will speak first, uh, Philippe next. If you can, please keep your answer to five minutes. And once we are done, we'll move to the next question. Hopefully after we are done with the three questions we have on the program, we'll have some time to uh, address some of the questions from the audience because some of them are really quite relevant and they, I feel they should go to you uh, as opposed to uh, presenters who presented before. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. So um, just sort of very quickly some, some thoughts on this um, first uh, set of issues. So the economics effects. So we all know that the impact is huge. So the, the, the economic shock is huge, but also, the asymmetry, the differentiation of this shock across regions, uh, it's, it's huge too. Huh? So the role of geography, of course, it's very important. Nobody, I think, will uh, deny that. We know that the role of geography in terms of this asymmetric shock of the, of the health shock is very big. You know, we see in France, in Italy, the differences across provinces in the, in the, in, and regions in terms of the prevalence of the, of the, 
of the contagion and the and the virus, and uh, and of course we also saw the the, the in in terms of the economic shock, this uh, this uh, this kind of significant differences that Paulo showed um, across regions. So the regions are not in the same foot in terms of the risks of exposure to this shock. Uh, Paulo said, you know, uh, things between 15 and 30, 35 percent of factors. Uh, uh, depending on the regions that, that could be more exposed. Also, certain combinations of regions and sectors are particularly, I would say, uh, sensitive. Imagine, for example, a region in my, in my country, Portugal, uh, like the south, uh, south of Portugal, Algarve. Algarve is mainly tourism. We know tourism is going to be one of the most affected sectors. Uh, the projections of the OECD for 2020 in terms of the international tourism Arts are a sort of a decline of something between minus 50% and minus 70%. So you go from 50% to, to 70, depending, for example, if things start, start to resume in September or not. But this is so, this is huge. Basically, you are, you, 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 you are saying that these international tourism flows are basically shut down for one year. Imagine the kind of impact that could have in a, in a, in a region like the south of Portugal or some regions in the south of, south of Greece. So also, I think the crisis uh, highlighted in a very strong way the disparities across regions. We know this is an issue, of course, for regional economists, but I think everybody now is, is really becoming much more aware of these disparities. Disparities to access to um, health care. We are finding, Paulo also sort of show some, some charts on that, on the differences on the number of hospital beds, and in particular, the differences in the number of beds that can be used for acute or intensive care. These things go from one to five, depending on, on countries and, and regions. Access to uh, high-speed internet. It's amazing, you know, in my country, in Portugal, again, okay, I understand big differences in access to internet between Lisbon and kind of interior parts of the country, but in the US, in Germany, huge differences. Uh, even if you, you find this kind of differences on this kind of digital divide within cities, even within cities, you can find this type sort of a uh, divide. Uh, the rural areas uh, sort of, uh, of course, uh, uh, display, and I think the, the, also the, the figure show it in a very neat way, the kind of low, type of low quality of internet in, uh, in rural areas. For example, in Italy, I was very struck when someone from the government of, of Italy told me that 40%, 42% of families in Italy don't have a proper uh, a sort of a, a, a computer and uh, communication equipment. 40% of the, of the Italian families. Also, uh, the, the digital skills are much lower in rural areas. Uh, also, the, 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 the kind of uh, sectoral specialization uh, in rural areas, the occupations in rural ar areas are much less amenable to telework. So this is going to exacerbate, as, as a potential, to exacerbate a lot of the uh, regional disparities. Of course, the issue of the different regions, what, what's going to be the dynamics of the reaction, of the, the recovery. We know, for example, that uh, in the previous big crisis, 2008, the differences between, uh, between say, the frontier regions, frontier in terms of uh, productivity, uh, very often associated with large cities, etc., and the others uh, sort of uh, uh, increased, if anything. Not everywhere, but in many countries, this divergence as it was exacerbated by, uh, for, for, by the 2008 crisis. So we don't know exactly what's going to be the impact of this crisis, but clearly there is a potential for increasing even, in, even more uh, uh, bigger regional disparities. In this issue of disparities and, and the way the different regions are going to react, I think one important piece is the, is the uh, SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprises. The figures, put forward by the OECD is that basically in two, three months, and this is kind of an average figure for the OECD, in two, three months, 40 to 50% of the SMEs is, are going to be at the risk of being out of business. Off of the SME sector. So this is a huge, huge shock. And of course, people say, okay, but some of these SMEs may be already in a very difficult sort of a situation. They're not very viable. Even some people say that is, uh, and, and there, are, there are sort of uh, estimates of that, of the kind of, there are zombie firms in our economies. The OECD put forward for 2013, things like 10% of zombie, uh, zombie firms in countries like, uh, like uh, <clears throat> I think Portugal, uh, Italy, or, uh, or Greece. But, you know, 10% of zombies, 50% of, of enterprises are going to be out of business. So the magnitude is not at all the same. So what we do? 
And what governments do basically is either they give money, either they lend money, or either they, in some sense, facilitate the exit mechanisms. So we need, in some sense, to find a good combination of these things. Because, of course, if you do only support, uh, uh, you know, if you do only liquidity support or non-conditional support, you may indeed be a sort of a helping non-viable enterprises to continue to leave, right? Uh, and uh, on the other hand, you also want to kind of facilitate this structural change that probably will happen as, as a consequence of this crisis. So it's very important, in, and then uh, I think we'll address th that in the, in the third question, how to manage, of course, these different uh, forms uh, of, of support. And in particular, I would say, in terms of the SME sector, finding new ways, new ways of financing the SME sector. Because uh, bank lending has very sort of uh, strong limitations. You know, you, you, we all know that the banks are not in a very good situation in these days. So, of course, if they have uh, public guarantees, they will do this lending. But we need to find much more diversified forms of, of, of financing for SMEs. Uh, things like, of course, venture, venture capital, public-private sort of partnerships, in things, even forms like uh, crowdfunding. So this is a very important sort of a policy line that needs to deal with these uh, impacts. Which I, 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 I sort of I, I stress again very differentiated impacts that will call necessarily for very differentiated policy responses. I stop. Um, oh, sorry, I, I, yes, I, I need to give the floor to, 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 to Philip. Sorry. Okay. Philip. Thank you, Joachim. Um, my observations in terms of thinking through what are going to be the most important economic consequences of the pandemic and particularly the role of geography. I think the important thing is to try and think of this shock almost in the way we think about disaster emergencies, that we, we go from an ordinary situation to an extraordinary situation, which involves a lot of legal, regulatory, emergency implementations. And then we try to move back to a normal situation or ordinary situation again. Um, and if we think about this, well, obviously what we've had now is these enormous cutbacks in consumption, production, employment, and all sorts of investment activities, as well as, of course, the normal social interaction, which is, is the lifeblood of commerce and business. And this rapid move from a normal environment to the emergency environment, if we think in terms of risks, this is a transition from a risk environment, which is how business works, to one of radical uncertainty. This goes back to the classic article by Frank Knight, uh, almost a century ago, where once we're in a world of radical uncertainty, it's not possible to determine anything through numerical uh, simulations, through calculations, because it's not possible to assign probabilities to anything. And that's the situation we're in at the moment. And then hopefully we're going to move slowly to a new normal, uh, an ordinary situation again, but of course it's unlikely to be the same situation it was previously. And that transition is going to be extremely complex. So we were in a world where the economy worked on probabilities and risks, it is now gone to a situation where most things are non-measurable, non-estimable, if you like, and we want to find a way to move back to a world where we go back to a world of probabilities and risks, because otherwise investment markets cannot function. What have we seen? What we've seen in the last few weeks is an incredible increase in the spread and the distribution of all forms of asset yields. The distribution, the deviation between safer assets and more risky assets has exploded. And that's between asset classes and that's within every asset class at the same time. So we're already seeing a massive capital reallocation process taking place where different forms of credit are being squeezed or being moved into different sectors, enormous restructuring in money markets, all sorts of asset markets. And in terms of the economic geography implications, for me, the immediate effect of that is it will lead to a widening of divergence between regions in the same country. Why? Because the spreads or the yields, as investors would talk about, are exploding. So places which are less prosperous um, become much more risky for investors who are now basically all involved in a flight to safety. The fact that investors couldn't even um, basically take up US Treasury bills a few weeks ago, people were dumping Treasury bills to, to move into cash, 
is something that we've simply never seen in the modern era. What do we see in terms of geography? There are some similarities with the 2008 crisis in that the, the shocks are originally or mainly in the bigger city areas or the more prosperous regions of many countries because of primarily density relationships. But what we know from the 2008 crisis is those places tended to respond quicker. They came out of the crisis quicker and the places that were left behind in the post-crisis shocks were the places which were more peripheral, more weaker. Now it's different in every country, but that's a broad pattern. My guess is that something similar will happen here because of the explosion of, of yields. Massive distribution and deviation in terms of discount rates according to different types of asset classes will also be replicated geographically. So there are some similarities, but there are also differences because of course, we expect more prosperous areas will probably recover quicker because of sectoral diversity, greater human capital, greater connectivity, all of those imply greater resilience of the system in these places. But also investors' perceptions of risk and resilience are shifting so quickly that they're likely to move to those places anyway. Also, if you think in terms of teleworking, telecommuting, a lot of people are doing what we're doing today. It's much easier for that to take place in higher human capital sectors in general, greater knowledge type work, at least as a transition, a substitution process. What we know from the famous Gaspar and Glaser paper, of course, back in about 97, I think it was, is that face-to-face uh, -face contact and electronic contact are very, very strong complements for each other. That's how the markets work. But in this case, they're being used as partial sub substitutes uh, for this interim phase, getting through the pandemic. But it's only a partial adjustment mechanism. It's not a long run solution because the markets that require, or the industries that require a great deal of tacit knowledge, which are the primarily the high value drives of the economy, they cannot go on indefinitely using teleworking, Zoom, FaceTime, whatever the, the models are, because they reply, re require tacit knowledge at so many stages of the business processes. So we are getting spatial and structural shocks. As I mentioned in my opening comments, in terms of the interest of the group at the OECD here, the issues on SMEs are, are extremely important. They will be squeezed enormously. They're being squeezed from the bottom because of clawbacks in, in funding. They're being squeezed by from the top because many bigger companies are now moving down investment grade profiles and are actually requiring greater bank funding in situations that previously that would not have been the case. Similarly with the venture capital markets, many investors are pulling out of venture capital markets for the same reasons and VC markets are likely to move to safer places again. There was a lot of evidence that VC markets had made some movements to weaker regions in the last four or five years, but my guess is that will be reversed dramatically. The other two areas where I think we have to be very focused on concerned about graduate markets or school leavers and university graduates, those markets will basically stop Two, two tiers of markets. So next year's markets and the year after, those markets will be heavily flooded. And another particular group are university cities. Very, very reliant on the flows of students and the, the, the role of university those they're also being exposed. So I'll pass, uh, pass you back to Joan. Thank you, thank you, Philippe. That was uh, really... Oof, it was exciting, but also the prospect of uh, minus 10% of uh, GDP that uh, Joachim mentioned and then increasing inequalities uh, doesn't really sit well with me, to be honest, but I think that's the reality that uh, places and firms and uh, families will have to deal with. So this brings me to the next question. Uh, what are actually the ways, what can firms, industries, and most importantly, places do to manage this crisis? So they manage to seize the new opportunities, whatever these opportunities are. Um, again, probably we'll go first with Joachim, please. Okay, thanks, Alexander. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I perhaps on my, on, on my sort of thought, I, I'm going to focus more on the opportunities than on the, on the minimization of, of costs, because the costs are, are what they are. You know, you shut down economies, so blah. It's, <laughs> it's very difficult to minimize things in a kind of... A, in, in, a, in, in this kind of situation. But clearly there is a set of issues that appears in terms of, the, of this adaptation or, or, or management of, of this situation. is the issue of the density as an advantage. We know that uh, in urban regional economics, this issue of dens density is one of the major sort of uh, drivers of these differences. 
we are seeing perhaps in the kind of in the urban context the emergence of this idea of a kind of urban penalty uh, urban health penal penalty even that of course was very present in the in cities in the 19th century that was resolved of course by by else uh, by a good uh, water distribution system sewage uh, sort of garbage treatment etc but sort of a uh, we are seeing again that this uh, this urban penalty of the 19th century that was tr transformed in the urban premium because actually life expectancy on average in cities was bigger than uh, in rural areas actually may now be transformed in something like a urban penalty if this kind of crisis may emerge again in the future i hope we'll be better sort of uh, prepared but so this raises the, the idea of the density as uh, as a factor of attractiveness right uh, could we replace physical uh, proximity by digital proximity interesting question could we replace uh, the connection with the digital hub when you are very small the way you 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 can benefit from the the externalities the good externalities of, of a network is to connect with the big hub can we replace the connection with a physical hub like a big city by a big digital sort of hub so all this i think brings a number of issues in terms of uh, opportunities i think the first issue is this idea of re-engineering of cities so all the cities are going to adapt to all these things this requires, for example, a very good discussion between uh, urban planners and economists in terms of the, uh, of the spatial planning issues, how to uh, think public space in cities. We know, for example, that uh, so already some big cities like Milan or Paris announced uh, big plans to sort of change the way you use uh, uh, streets uh, in the city. So much more use of sort of uh, bikes uh, and, uh, and sort of... Uh, uh, for you know for people are rather than cars and of course public uh, transportation also the rethinking of culture and sports events not easy hmm? this uh, this kind of activities are going to probably uh, they're, they're not going to be deconfined in next month right so it's uh, or this month that's that's for sure this is this will take time but for that we'll need to uh, discover new ways of how to organize this type um, of events um, also, this, this issue of uh, adaptation of cities is really this, this very tricky question how to deconfine and at the same time maintain this social distance. I think this is a very sort of a tricky question, but that at the same time may generate some opportunities for cities, but they, they need to, to be in some sense very smart. If you look at uh, more on the, on the rural areas, it's clearly that these opportunities for distant remote work are there. But for that, of course, we need to accelerate digitalization. We have been talking about uh, issues like distributed uh, additive manufacturing, could be an opportunity. Things like uh, the location of services, these globotics that uh, Richard Baldwin is, is uh, so, so fun of. of. But for, you know, of course, for that, we need to develop in rural areas, of course, things like teleworking, online delivery of education and training, online commerce, SMEs now to have sort of a, a, this almost, should be like an objective like uh, that SMEs should have the possibility to do online commerce but of course for all these we need this digital infrastructure and for that we'll need uh, probably a lot of public investment another sort of a set of issues in terms of opportunity is revisiting globalization of course uh, we have been, people have been talking about the relocation of production uh, but uh, as uh, Philippe I'm, I'm sure he's going to talk about that there are a lot of holes in the product space and we cannot become, you know, shift to a more self-subsistence type of world. I think it will be totally silly. Globalization is a driver of income and progress and, uh, and well-being. But again, we need to be smart and perhaps combine some industrial policy ideas with, with sort of a regional policy. The smart specialization could play a very important role. And my final set of issues that could be uh, actually treated almost like uh, opportunities is perhaps after this crisis, there will be some change in the preferences for public goods some sort of public goods that is not impossible right um green measures for example people saw for example that the quality of air in cities is connected to the uh, resilience to uh, to a sort of a, um, a pandemic so uh, a connection there uh, people pro for example would accept more easily all these measures that uh, wanted to uh, uh, make cities more uh, smarter and and and, uh, and green uh, also, the role for the, social, uh, for, for the social economy. A lot of interesting sort of a solutions, community-based solutions for managing the crisis were actually put forward by the social economy, by the social economy uh, enterprises. Uh, the resilience of health systems too. Huh? 
I think uh, I think you know uh, we have you know this crisis in some sense raised the issue of the efficiency versus resilience in many areas of the economy, in particular in the in the health sector. I think this could create a certain opportunities perhaps for reestablish this balance balance of access to health services uh, in sort of a more disadvantaged areas and reestablish a bit this this sort of imbalance that exists. Although we know that the health sector, of course, requires a lot of uh, sort of mass and density to be uh, very efficient. So this is sort of a set of issues. So regenerating cities, this issue of accelerate digitalization, rural areas, the revisiting of globalization, and this perhaps changing preferences for public goods could be in, indeed a set of opportunities, uh, both for cities and for rural areas. Thank you. Uh, Phil, Phil, I give you the floor now. <laughs> Thinking about opportunities uh, is a difficult is a difficult one, as, as Joachim said. But it, of course, is it's critical. In the short term, who do I think are going to be the winners? If anyone can be described as a winner in this situation, my guess is private equity companies and some hedge funds are probably going to be the only short term winners, um, along with companies that specialize in online services and deliveries. Um, Beyond that, I think there's likely to be a shift towards greater concentration and monopoly positions in many markets, simply because of the shocks, the fallout, um, and monopoly positions, as we know, tend to favor divergence, including spatial divergence. Again, going back to this point about the transition from an ordinary to an extraordinary situation, and then to back to some sort of ordinary or new normal uh, type context, the difficulty is that People's expectations, um, household expectations, employer expectations, and again, fundamentally, ec investor expectations, they've all been shocked. And it's not clear at the moment what the pathways are for those to recover. The reason is that investors' expectations are very weakly grounded. It means they have let very little information on which to base decisions. Um, they have very little comparisons on which to base decisions. And an interesting feature, particularly in the economic geography field, is that actually they don't even have the legal facilities to make decisions. Many of you will know that many real estate investment trusts have actually been temporarily closed. Um, a lot of real estate investment activities, which are crucial for the development of the infrastructure, the built environment of cities and regions, has basically stopped. And this, this is something which is very, very new. In terms of our shocks to trade, then of course, global demand shocks are reducing final demand for final goods and services. Whereas the supply chain shocks to do with social distancing, uh, the closure of factories and so on, um, those type activities tend to be pan-regional, which means they operate across groups of adjacent countries. So of course we know that global value chains are very heavily embedded across Europe and also across North America, across South and East Asia. So the difficulty here is how do we reopen those global value chains? Because it also requires coordination between groups of countries to get those value chains working. Because in many parts of the value chain system, the strength of the system is only as strong as the weakest part. All you need is one or two linkages in that system not to be open, and the whole value chain doesn't work. So this is a very, very difficult problem that people are struggling with at the moment. As I mentioned earlier, there are parts of the economy which are able to sort of keep going through teleworking, um, using this as a substitute. But is that really what our future economy is going to look like? I'm not sure. I think there will be a little bit more homeworking, people choosing to work one, two, three days a week, whatever, at home, rather than going into the office. I think there'll be some, some of those things will be taking place, at least in the, in the short term and the medium term. There will be some reductions of commuting into cities, um, but again, is that going to be the fundamental structural change? Um, if we don't find any solution to the virus, if there's no vaccine produced for many years, then probably the answer is yes. If a vaccine is produced in the next year or two, then there will be some structural change. But my guess is the economies will then go back to something much more like what we understand today as being normal. Um, there will be increased use of things like obviously online shopping, um, certain business facilities which are primarily serviced online, that obviously has implications for high streets. You know, what happens to the cores of our cities and our towns, which thrive on face-to-face -face contact? Um, there will also be some 
reconfiguration of spaces. Joachim has just mentioned that. How do we think about the redesign of, of cities? But this is more complicated because it also relates to the, the redesign of public services and the provision of public services, as well as uh, private services. At the moment, it's really an open question of how that might work out. What we do know is a huge number of major real estate developments are probably likely to stop, to be canceled before they take place, or at least to be redesigned and restructured. And that will have implications for you know, the next five, 10 years in terms of the development of our cities and regions. There is likely to be, many people argue, there's likely to be greater usage of automation because automation can get around some of the social distancing challenges. And the difficulty there is if we look at pre previous recessions, all of the recessions since the Second World War have involved increases in productivity through the recession as firms and industries completely restructure, take on board the shocks and try, try to rigor what they do. The exception was the recent crisis of 2008, where economies went through that crisis and didn't come out with enhanced productivity. They, they came out with actually uh, equivalent or even lower productivity in many cases. And we know that there are very strong regional aspects to how those productivity responses to the uh, previous crisis were. My guess is this crisis will look more like the previous crisis than the crises prior to that. My guess is that we won't see a productivity bounce. We're probably so likely to see the opposite. There will be some nearshoring of activities, uh, some increased localization of certain types of activities. But as Joaquin mentioned, the ability to do that is actually very limited. If you look at any of the work on product space literature, network, trade um, programs, if you look at all that kind of data, the ability of countries to do that is already heavily dependent on how dense the existing trade technology relationships are. So the movement, the opportunities for movement for different countries are very limited in this. Um, the post-vaccine prognosis, obviously, is so, you know, we, we wish that the vaccine is produced as quickly as possible. My guess is that many aspects of the economy will return to pre-crisis levels simply because many of the pre-crisis investments them, themselves were being discounted over 10, 15, 20, 25 years. But there's no consensus of what the pathway is going to look like. And I'm sure you've read in the literature, people are advocating a V-shaped relationship or a possibly a Z-shaped a Z bounce back relationship that's slightly left top, less optimistic. What about a W-shaped uh, response where things are going up and down like this? That's less optimistic, a bit more pessimistic. And then the really pessimistic scenarios are a long U-shaped uh, response or even an L-shaped response. And all of these are possible. Why? Because there is still a fear of future waves of contagion. So I'll pass back to Joachim at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim and uh, Philippe. Ah. Again, it's uh, really, in a sense, depressing to, to listen to it, but I think, again, it is uh, the reality that is shaping up, and uh, we did cover quite a bit of uh, expected changes in human behavior and economic activity. I would like to ask uh, my speakers right now to very briefly touch upon the expected changes in the policy landscape coming out of the, uh, out of the crisis, and uh, especially how it relates to the place-based policies. Mm -hmm. um, so, Joachim, the floor is yours. Alexander, you should, you, should, you should not be too pessimistic because, after all, you know, <laughs> a crisis is always... No, uh, no, I believe we, we will rebound, that's for sure. <laughs> but listening all this, uh, what we expect to see in the next few years, it is definitely not what I expected to see in the next few years in my life. But, oh well. Okay, so, no, policy is reaction of governments. So, I would say that in the beginning, most of the actions didn't have a particularly sort of a place-based com place component. It was kind of more across the board type of uh, sort of measures, right? And in particular, sort of a lot of them were, were taken by, by central governments, of course, a bit in the urgency mode. But I think very quickly, uh, the role of the subnational dimensions, the, the role of subnational governments emerged in a very sort of a strong way. Things like, for example, the, the more targeted support to the fragile or disadvantaged sort of populations. Think about the young, the students, uh, the migrants, uh, informal workers. Um, so for this, you need really something which is much more tailored. You need this kind of more uh, uh, granular information. And there, I think the subnational sort of governments and dimensions were very important. Also, we already discussed this combination of the confinement with social distance needs to be place-based. 
I don't see how we are going to do that in a kind of a space blind manner. The support to SMEs, of course, the support may be sort of across the board, uniform, but then a lot of SMEs locally don't even don't know they, they have the possibility to have this kind of uh, grants or loans. Or, so it's very important there also that the, 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 so the, the, the subnational governments channel uh, this information. Also in terms of the structural issues, I think very important the, 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 the role of subnational governments to link you know, the adaptation to this crisis and the environmental transition. There is a big risk, of course, that all this discussion about climate change is going to be a bit put aside, you know, given, you know, the economic sort of, uh, you know, stress and strain. Uh, the oil price is at $20, so very difficult to sell renewable energy when oil price is at $20 per barrel, right? So it's very important to connect, uh, you know, to connect, for example, what we discussed about air quality of cities, resilience to pandemics, these connections need to be done at the local level. Also, connecting recovery to, for example, green growth uh, sort of uh, actions. Uh, so, uh, this renovation of buildings in cities, for example. So, this is also a sort of a more on the structural side, where, where indeed uh, the role of the national governments is very important. The skills to compete, all this call for digitalization, we need the skills to compete. We did, for example, uh, sort of analysis on the exposure to the risk of automation at the regional level. Uh, and these, the actions uh, need to be taken uh, at the more sort of granular level. In many countries, actually, training policies, a lot of training policies, are actually the responsibility, the competence of region or local governments. But, uh, you know, in overall, I think in terms of policy responses, I think local governments have been really at the forefront, both in cities and rural. Of course, we talk about support to business, continuity of public services. Can you imagine in cities if anything happened in terms of these public services? Uh, uh, addressing uh, vulnerable groups, as I said, uh, increasing communication awareness uh, about the situation, uh, workplace and, uh, and commuting, of course, social distancing and, uh, and confinement. This was kind of the main policy actions in cities, responses that we identified because we did a survey of what cities are doing. On the rural side, of course, improving digital infrastructures, this main, main action. Uh, ensuring basic services, the community responses to help food and medical equipment. A lot of interesting actions that were done at, at, uh, at the local level on these, mobilizing networks of uh, healthcare workers, something that actually compensated for some of the shortcomings of access to health, uh, health uh, services in rural area, and of course supporting business um, and community. But the main issue in all this is the alignment, is the coordination, is actually what we call in a more some, sometimes cryptic way, the multi-level governance system. Uh, and in particular, the impact of all these on subnational finances. So uh, we're seeing the revenues of uh, all, level, all levels of government, in particular subnational governments, uh, you know, going down. The spending is going up because subnational governments in a lot of places are in charge of many social uh, policy lines. So the Caesar effect means attention, uh, a pressure on the public deficit at the subnational level. How you're going to finance this deficit? Can you raise that at the subnational level? In, in some OECD countries, even that's, that's forbidden. In Chile, for example, the subnational governments cannot raise that, full stop. So how we are going to finance this increasing deficit? If you look at the 2008 crisis, most of these pressures were actually resolved by one thing, cutting public investment. And we know that most public investment is done by subnational governments. So I see there, I think, a very big risk. And of course, we also have to uh, sort of be careful about this sometimes idea that in a situation like that, we need to recentralize. So uh, decentralized systems can be more messy, more difficult to manage. That's, I think, is a very big mistake because it's not really the level of decentralization that matters, it's really the, the quality of the coordination of this alignment, and of course that shows, uh, that shows in some countries. So my final point is really this bridge between the short run and, uh, and, uh, and the, and the longer run that we've been discussing. So we have more and more now, kind of, as we get out of, out of this confinement emergency mode, make these bridges, for example, provide liquidity support with some set clauses, that's important, or forward, regulatory plans in order to announce to the companies when this kind of liquidity short-term support is going to end, right? Or be phased, phased out, right? For example, you could combine these measures with improving bankruptcy procedures. So you help enterprises, but at, some, uh, at the same time, you also help the exit mechanisms. 
uh, you know, judges and, uh, and uh, commercial courts are going to be overloaded by bankruptcies, probably over the next months. Conditioning, for example, the, the, this, uh, this sort of support to, adopt, to the adoption of dig digital technologies. The European Commission was proposing to have a sort of di digi digitalization vouchers, right? Uh, and also uh, acquisition of uh, digital sort of skills. And also, and also, I think, uh, conditioning uh, or using part of the support to facilitate this, this green transition. I think it's, this is very important. The, the connection of the, of the, in terms of the green transition should not be forgotten. And, uh, and, uh, and the fact that this green transition could bring, indeed, more resilience to our, uh, to our economies in all kinds of levels. So this is a bit my, my sort of a policy space. Uh, but if, again, uh, Alexandra, uh, I have more questions than, <laughs> than answers. But... <laughs> Voilà, c'est comme ça. <laughs> now I give the floor to Philippe. Thank you, Joachim. Um, yes, your point about debts and deficits is absolutely critical because, of course, one of the immediate re results of the crisis across the world is central government becomes more dominant um, because they're having to literally, in some sense, take over ownership in different forms, even if it's uh, these debt relief schemes or whatever it is, uh, temporary. Uh, employment schemes, etc. But many more parts of the economy, the central government's role has become much more pronounced. And so there's, a, there's been shocks and changes to the balance of power between role and roles between national government and sub-national government. Now, firstly, at the macro level, how's that going to play out? Well, it depends on the speed of fiscal retrenchment, how rapidly a government's going to try and claw back a lot of that expenditure or cover their expenditure how are they going to do that? It's going to be different in different markets in different countries. It's also going to be dependent on the willingness of markets to lend to governments. And that's kind of unknown at the moment. As I say, we've already seen that people are dumping US Treasury bills in March, which is really hard to imagine. So we don't know about that at the moment. Um, but as Joachim also said, which is really, really important, local administrations, local governments has been absolutely central worldwide in finding responses on the ground to the crisis in terms of health provision, information provision for, for citizens, community care actions, and get, uh, educational reorganization, local facilities, organization teaching, all sorts, travel and mobility management in the new regime, waste management um, uh, issues, policing, security, the list goes on and on. Actually, the OECD produced a very nice note recently documenting these at the levels of cities and regions. But of course, the ability and the roles of subnational government to play these uh, roles and actions depends on the levels of devolution, depends on the responsibilities. So I think what is required, and this is very, very important, and I think the OECD is probably in the best position to take this on, is we need to reconsider the relationship between the center and the subnational, the center and the local, in terms of promoting resilience. And this should also include civil society organizations, who again have been extremely important in the responses. So there are longer term local public finance challenges precisely because the national public financial situations have changed out of all imagination in a matter of weeks. But on the other hand, we also have a great deal of evidence of what's been happening. So on a country by country basis, it's really important to identify what has worked well and what did not work well. To identify the key lessons and experiences in this transition process in the original shock, the extraordinary situation, and then also moving forward into the transition phase back to some sort of new normal. What has worked and what has not at the local, at the subnational? Because that will give enormous reconnaissance and evidence in terms of how we're going to rethink our public finances and our reorganization of public services in a way which builds back some sort of enhanced resilience into our economic and social systems. Um, the question of moving back, we don't suddenly want a cliff edge, as Joachim said, we need some sort of sunset clauses to provide a kind of a tapering approach so that businesses and households can slowly readjust to a new reality. Um, but we also need to think the balance of local and national responsibilities also in the transition process, not just the emergency situation, but the transition process itself is going to be very important in learning those lessons. So documenting what has been working in different countries, what hasn't worked so well and why, is an enormous part of policy transfer, which I think can benefit many, many different countries. So it's this question of institutional alignment in this context of radical uncertainty. We have to use this situation
to learn to rethink how we're going to move forward. You know, I am concerned, as many people are, the kind of, you know, certain political movements which are against international coordination, um, that's not going to help us. Why? Because even though, let's say within Europe, for example, we know that health is a devolved national competence, but actually we've seen that health is not just a national competence, it's an international phenomenon. And that is true in many issues, uh, climate change mitigation, trade promotion, research and development, knowledge flows and innovation are all transnational. They're global phenomena to do with flows of resources, of knowledge, of people. And finding ways to reorganize and rethink those dimensions is extremely important. The most important of all still is the question of the sustainable de development goals. The movement towards the Paris Agreement targets is likely to be, let's say, stalled. It might even be reversed at least temporarily, yes, we've had reductions in greenhouse gases because of people not being able to travel, but the likelihood is the fiscal retrenchment and the recovery process that the countries are going to be engaged in may well actually put a many, many of these sustainable development goals actually on the back burner for a while. That is very dangerous. Why? Because we don't have time on these issues. We can't leave this for another five years or 10 years to rethink these things again. So how do we find ways to build back in the transition period and beyond where we embed the sustainable development goals regarding sustainability and inclusiveness into how we reconfigure our cities and our regions for the future? And I'll hand thank you back to Alexandra at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Joachim. We are definitely behind time, so we will not be able to take any questions. I would like to pass the floor to Raquel. Uh, Raquel uh, Artega Argilis, who will be offering uh, concluding remarks, and I would like to thank all the audience who's still with us. I see quite a few people still listening in. So, uh, Raquel is a chair in regional economic development at the Department of Strategy in International Business and the City Ready Research Institute at the University of Durham. Uh, she did a lot of uh, research. Uh, on productivity, innovation, regional development, entrepreneurship, and other issues. And I would like to uh, give the floor to Raquel. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Can you hear me well? Um, well, thank you for the nice introduction and also for inviting me uh, to be here today. Um, hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, what to say for starting is that it has been a super interesting discussion uh, with lots of uh, different views, ideas and observations. In the next um, 10 minutes, although I'm trying to get a bit uh, fast, uh, I'm going to try uh, to summarize the most important insights uh, raised uh, in this eighth meeting of the OECD Spatial Productivity Lab at the OECD. COVID-19, as said by our panelists today, is a central issue to all economies and it has consequences for the private and public sectors that are going to affect region sectors and workers in many different ways. Regarding the most important economic consequences of the pandemic, um, our panelists have mentioned in their interventions that uh, we might foresee a dramatic cutback in consumption, production and investment activities as well as in the social interaction activities of business and commerce. Uh, also, uh, we may see capital reallocation between uh, different sectors and actors, uh, different types of uh, forms of credits, lending, restructuring the money, and different types of assets markets are going to be affected. We are going to see as well value change disruptions uh, at the global and national level affecting sectors and regions differently. And demand shocks as a consequence of lockdowns, shutdowns, and credit availability. And also, uh, as a consequence of that, a reduction of the demand of, of labor. The role of geography in those aspects is really important. So I'm going to try to, to, to um, summarize the special heterogeneity that uh, has come up in some of the um, 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 uh, speakers' uh, presentations. So. Um, we have seen an especially heterogeneity in the economic consequences of COVID because of different death tolls and pressure in the health sector and differences in the hospital beds. Um, 
we have also seen that different industrial structures and therefore different presses, presence of the most affected sec sectors, this combination uh, of regional and sectoral um, structures um, due to the uh, shift downs as well, um, we have seen that manufacturing of transport equipment, construction, um, retail, air transport, accommodation, real estate, professional services activities, art, entertainment and recreation and other personal activities seems to be the ones that are more affected for these uh, shutdowns. Um, we have seen that um, these um, uh, heterogeneous regional effects are a consequence of the shutdowns but also their dura duration. So um, as uh, Paolo was mentioning, one out of five regions, um, in, in one out of five regions, more than 30% of jobs are at risk uh, because of these short-term um, consequences of the uh, shutdowns. And um, they, um, the effects of, uh, um, uh, in jobs, it runs between uh, 15 and 35% across the regions that have been analyzed, with a country regional variation sometimes of 20 percentage points. Um, the heterogeneous uh, regional effects are also a consequence of the presence of particular key sectors like the tourism or tourism-related sectors. We have seen, we have seen these uh, um, processes in, in, in the case of Italy or in Spain uh, due to the shutdowns and also the limitation of travel. Uh, we have also seen the effects of uh, in higher education, so uh, as Philip was mentioning, um, probably university towns because of uh, the effects or in higher education uh, it might be affected by this um, um, COVID-19. We have also seen heterogeneous regional effects as a consequence of the presence of SMEs. So uh, we have seen that SMEs are a particular uh, key sector and are directly affected with uh, cutbacks in credit availability. And also um, it was uh, nice to see Mattia, uh, the illustration of the different business support measures, the propensity and the co occurrence of these uh, business support uh, um, categories um, with areas more um, uh, trying to cover as much as possible business support while others uh, were focusing more on social aspects uh, on work related or care related uh, support. Um, we have seen as well heterogeneous regional effects as a consequence of the value chain disruptions. Um, regions with higher global uh, trade dependency with economies that specialize in credible manufacturing and service sectors seem to be the most uh, severely affected due to the disruptions of the just-in-time production, but also the reduction of demand. Um, so increase in trade openness, that is the percentage of threat of the GDP, might face a higher risk due to the disruptions in travel flows. And we have seen how some areas that are key in, um, in uh, logistics and also the major ports seem to be the more affected, like Hamburg in Germany. We have also seen uh, in the work by Alexandra interesting insights on the uh, regional heterogeneity due to, due to the collapse, uh, collapse of the demand uh, for labor and the changes you know, of labor demand. So we have seen how regions in the UK and Canada are most heavily affected uh, but also we have seen the differences uh, in, in the countries across regions um, with um, uh, clear um, differences in the reduction uh, of uh, the vacancy announcements um, in the case of the UK uh, and Canada. There is a re great regional variation in how labor demand changed recently within the industries, in the same uh, industries affected differently um, across regions. And uh, it was interesting to see that urban areas are not necessarily the less, uh, uh, the most affected or the less affected here. It has been a, a variation in the effect in, in the case of London, for instance, appearing as the third region more affected in the case of the UK. I would like to, um, to dedicate a bit more attention to the urban regional divide. So we have seen uh, from different presentations uh, how uh, the urban and regional divide seem to be a bit more exacerbated by this COVID-19. So urban areas are more affected by production discontinuity, um, shutdowns of services, supply chains, disruptions, while rural areas seem to be more affected as having fewer occupations amenable by teleworking, but also at having 50% point of difference in teleworkability. 
Um, so we have this kind of potential substitution effects between um, the effect of connectivity and with, uh, as um, Joaquin was mentioning, uh, potential digital opportunity for some uh, regions to catch up in this uh, uh, crisis. We have seen as well in the case of um, rural areas that they seem to be less prepared because um, they have lower collectivity in terms of good telecommunication infrastructures or logistic accessibility as well. So there is a huge digital divide and also a particular digital skills uh, divide between uh, these uh, urban and rural regions. I would like to finish maybe with some um, opportunities as well. So I'm going to link between the two uh, questions uh, connected with the opportunities and what uh, the industries and places are doing to manage this crisis. So opportunities, um, Joaquim was very uh, nice uh, trying to put some light in this uh, discussion. So um, um, Joaquim was talking about the adaptation of cities. Is that just an uh, opportunity to change the way that uh, cities are working, you know, maybe um, reducing also uh, the commuting patterns, allowing more uh, for uh, teleworking. But also, it was interesting to see this uh, need of uh, better conversations between urban planners and economists, and also to find maybe solutions uh, to support, for instance, um, uh, the role of uh, density uh, as an advantage, but also as now as a urban penalty. Um, we have also seen uh, opportunities in the accelerate digitalization with the idea of uh, digital vouchers, the digitalization vouchers for SMEs in particular as one of um, the um, uh, group of uh, firms that seem to be more affected and also the group of firms that are also more represented in the in the fabric of uh, many countries. So uh, re-education of services, maybe online commerce, e-services, um, e, um, uh, uh, but also um, maybe revisiting uh, globalization and this area that I like, of course, thinking about maybe near shoring or maybe um, looking at um, diversification as a possibility uh, to overcome uh, this uh, maybe um, industrial locking and, and problems of uh, um, that um, might be uh, de 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 derived because of the holes in the product space, as uh, Joachim was mentioning mentioning. Um, also uh, changing the preference of public group, goods and also maybe green measures. Um, so the role of the social economy, it was very nice also point by Joaquin, or uh, looking at the uh, combination of measures that look at efficiency and resilience. So um, Philip had a bit uh, a more uh, pessimistic view of all of this and uh, was talking about that um, uh, maybe um, one way of uh, trying to uh, look at this is that, that many areas are going to be affected differently. So in the case of cities, for instance, uh, what is going to happen with high streets when we are uh, looking at the, uh, maybe the e-commerce uh, or um, uh, is, is going, uh, is increasing. And um, what is also going to happen with uh, the opportunities of, of finance? So, so some areas that uh, seem to be more attractive, but also uh, urban areas nowadays because seem to be uh, less risky. So what is going to happen with those rural areas or areas that seem to be um, more uh, deprived or uh, uh, somehow uh, farther away for uh, being in a, in, a post, in, a, in a prosperous position? So uh, to, to end up, um, uh, it was nice to see uh, that uh, accountability, also monitoring, evaluating what has happened in the past might also help to somehow reshape the, the current uh, situation and reshape the, the future. So uh, Philip was talking about short, medium and long term adjustments in expectations uh, might be also they might have to be uh, coordinated by uh, looking at um, what has happened in the past. And uh, finally, um, the plea for a better coordination between multi-level governance and also uh, a better uh, quality of this coordination. So we, we know that has been happening, but maybe uh, now it has to be also uh, um, uh, reshaped and also maybe stress that coordination is probably uh, what is going to solve uh, this uh, big crisis. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel. Um,
we are ready to close the meeting right now because we already went over time and i again thank all the panelists it was a wonderful discussion i learned a lot myself um, i thank our listeners who are still here with us uh, we, we do appreciate your time and we hope to see you at the next uh, spl meetings thank you so much <laughs>